Hello, my name is Tom Franke. I am the CEO of Hermes Medical Solutions. It is a pleasure to welcome you to this symposium on innovations for fast and accurate dosimetry. We at Hermes Medical have at heart to continuously innovate to enable faster and more personalized diagnostics and therapies in molecular imaging. With that said, I would like to introduce the program of this symposium and thank our clinical speakers for sharing their experiences. Today's program is a perfect example of that and our tight collaboration with the scientific community. Professor Giesel, who is the head of the nuclear medicine department at the University Hospital in Düsseldorf, has made us the honor to open this symposium. He will talk about the impact of dosimetry in translational research and define how it brings added value in the development of probes. His talk will be a nice introduction to the second part of this symposium, focusing on how dosimetry innovations by Hermes Medical Solutions are being used clinically. Helena McMakin, our clinical application scientist, will give a demonstration of the latest dosimetry innovations in Hermes Medical software. To conclude this program, we are very excited to have Lydia Rahm, clinical scientist at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, to present on how dosimetry is being used clinically for lutetium procedures. I hope you will enjoy the program we have put together and we will be happy to connect with you and hear your potential questions after the presentations. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, thanks for inviting uh, me at the meeting. Uh, I'm Professor Giesel, Chair of Nuclear Medicine at the University Hospital Düsseldorf. I've been a track record uh, in the past, uh, particularly also with the Heidelberg team, in introducing several tracers like PSMA 617, PSMA 107, uh, for uh, theranostic purposes in prostate cancer, but also recently with a FAP ligand. And we have been always exposed, so to say, in the topic of what is the absorbed doors in these kind of new developed traces. Therefore, I'm sharing with you these topics today in this, my short talk. So just my short disclosures. I want to talk about the introduction and the motivation and also some aspects of um, dosimetry than basic principles today and their developments in the last decay, and then of course clinical applications, uh, why I see that there's an important cornerstone for imaging and also diagnostic stratification. So uh, a letter to the editor uh, just a few years ago indicated that uh, the scientific field concerned with, of course, biological effects of radiation whether for therapy or radiation protection purposes. So the important thing is that all has been more or less measured the aspect of absorbed dose. Another statement has been um, recently uh, also come from the European Union that states that radiotherapeutic purposes, which include targeted radionuclide therapies, should be both planned and verified. So therefore, the implication of um, a dosimetry, I think it comes on the table, not only now it has been developed in the past, but of course, particular with the development of certain also topics of artificial intelligence will be the requisite for this avenue. So there has been done great efforts, of course, of assess absorbed doses in cell and tissues and organs as a prerequisite for treatment planning and for verification of absolute doses. Uh, dosimetry and treatment planning in radionuclide therapy should be, and that's very important, sure pass simple assessment of absorbed dose, this on an individual uh, patient level. And of course, dosimetry also takes into account major biological effects, so topics of organ that's risk, but also the DNA damage of repair mechanism and pharmaceutical itself, so the kinetics in normal tissue and tumors. The last, if we're looking to the something impulses of the present situation, has been many improvements in regard to the quantification of spec CT images, reducing the so to say, uncertainties in the absorbed dose calculation. Then still there are limitations when we're looking on certain radioisotopes and 
also what is now really in, in all uh, clinical um, discussion are the radioisotope alpha emitter like lead or actinium-225, which still at the moment challenge dosimetric approaches. On the other hand, kinetic modeling is about to become an important tool for predicting radiopharmaceutical related effects, like of course pharmacokinetics and dynamics, and also when we're doing probe development. So by going this, we always in nuclear medicine addressing the topic of theranostics or so imaging and therapy. So therefore, in radionuclide therapy is the role of radiobiological conjunction with dosimetric at a cellular microscopic and macroscopic scale need to be more strengthened as it is doing at the moment. However, the key to any type of radiation therapy is to ensure the sufficient absorbed dose in the target lesion, which is particular tumor lesions, while minimizing the risk organs in normal tissues, like, for example, kidney. So when we look to the evaluation of that avenue in personalized dosimetry, Olinda in uh, 2012 have more, say, set the gold standard, but then it went further on in organ dosimetry. So going really on a patient-based surrogate of their derivatives of um, this information. And then, of course, going further in voxel-based uh, dosimetry and even at the end point in 2021 in a single time point measurement. So we are, I think, at the moment at that point where we can deliver certain perspectives and also clinical impact in diagnostic, but also in therapy purposes. And this should be more and more getting a cornerstone for our clinical management. Looking for the diagnostic purposes, if we're looking about the effective dose in general, and we are scaling that up to all imaging modalities, you will see that PET, of course, is one that also impact in regard to the effective dose on a patient care level. And this is something also for the probe development, which is very important. I uh, would like to give you here an example of a development that I was also oversee with colleagues in Heidelberg, with Dr. Cardinale, where probes like, for example, here the PCMA ligands has been identified and developed in preclinical settings, showing their impact in tissue uptake and also clear clearance in the kidneys. Interestingly, by translating it then to patient care, the kinetics and dynamics have been a little bit different. We discovered suddenly that has a clearance via the hepatoid barrier route, which also impact uh, in the effective dose. So therefore, dosimetric information and the time activity curve of certain probe developments is important to then also benchmark that to, of course, certain other probe developments in the arena of PCMA ligands. And this is, shows you such an overview, how important it is to understand where the tracer is taking up of certain normal, of course, organs, and also what kind of effective dose we can expect to certain tracers and how we can benchmark it to, for example, standard or gold standard of these tracer development. So this is one, I think, major cornerstone. Another, I think, uh, vibe at the moment are the FAP ligands. Also, this has been recently translated from preclinical to clinical environment. And we need also to assess how here we are benchmarked the absorb dose to other imaging probes that are well known. And we have been also done that. And for here, for example, of a recent publication, we also scaled it and also categorized that in regard, for example, to FDG, to Dota Talk, PCMA, and so on. And you see, because FAP is very specific and have rather zero off target uh, of normal tissues, that the effective dose is rather very low. And that's also a very important surrogate that we are deriving from that. But also I think in therapy and also now considering the vision trial has been positively getting out for PCMA therapy, that we also need to implement more the topic of this application of dosimetry and therapeutic management. And here, just an example of um, nice data from my colleague Vasco Kramer 
from Chile who presented a new piece may um, ligand for therapy with a clear more binding affinity to albumin, but also this impact into the kinetic and dynamic, so also of the clearance and uptake into normal, but also tumor uptake. And will, of course, reflect also the topic of absorbed dose, which impact on the one hand, of course, tumor effectivity, but on the other hand, it will impact certain side effects like kidney toxicity and bone marrow toxicity, which we also have to appreciate and encounter. Therefore, this is so important also then to put a benchmark this information of the translation into the concept of current publication and knowledge, how the ranges and how maybe the better improvement of tumor uptake is, but also that we consider the toxicity of normal organs, particular kidney or salivary gland. With this, I would like to uh, summarize this short presentation of the topic of dosimetric from a uh, physician per, uh, perspective. So dosimetric of course plays an important part in the field of diagnostic tracer development, as I should present it to you, of PSMA ligand or FAP ligand to really uh, get an understanding of effective dose and absorbed dose in normal organs. But in addition, I think to get more into the approvals of radionuclide therapy, the importance of understanding of individual dosimetric data are important for therapeutic planning in the field of radionuclide therapy. In this regard, we also have the topic of the artificial intelligence, which also will be have more so to say resource power and kind of um, uh, computer um, compiling these data nowadays. And therefore I think dosimetric has a big cornerstone also in the future in regard to individualized patient care. With this, I would like to close my session and thanks for listening. My name is Helena McMeekin. I'm a clinical application scientist working for Hermes. Today, we'll be talking about the latest innovations in the Hermes dosimetry software. So what we have here is three time points post-therapy lutetium imaging. So we have a SPEC CT on day one, day four, and day seven post-therapy. Now, traditionally, you'd have to load all of these time points into software for processing to calculate the dose. But with the latest software innovations from Hermes, you just have to choose one. So we can choose the day four the day four spec CT and I load it into our voxel dosimetry software. So here you can see the spec CT. This has already been reconstructed with quantitative reconstruction. That can be done with the Hermes Medical Solutions SUV spec hybrid reconstruction software or it can be done um, externally on your own camera if you have a camera which will output data spec reconstruction data with voxel values of becquerels per mil. So because we only have one time point, there is no alignment to do. We can go straight on and set up the dosimetry calculation. So we choose the imaging isotope. Because we're doing post-therapy dosimetry here, we both image with lutetium and treat with lutetium. But you can see that we do have a number of other available isotopes. So if you wanted to do um, so yeah, a workup with Indium 111, then you can set up the theranostic dose prediction with Indium 111 as the imaging isotope. And then you could ask the software to predict what the dose would be uh, for lutetium. But for us, we're just doing lutetium and lutetium here. Type in the activity that was given to the patient and the time to the first scan. So for us, day four scan, we've got 96 hours. Now we have to have the software what to assume for the rest of the time. So because we only have one time point of imaging information, we need to know for the dose calculation how the activity changes over time or rather how to model that change. So we have three options. We have physical half-life. So that would be appropriate for a CERT, for example, or anything that just stays put uh, in the patient and does not decay with any kind of biological half-life. Effective half-life, so if you, if you know from previous measurements what effective half-life to expect, you can just type that in there. That is then applied to the whole body. Or the Hanscheid approximation. So this is a really exciting new calculation method 
uh, the paper was published a few years ago by a group in Germany uh, led by Hans Scheid. We have the paper here. This is please refer to this for all of the details if you'd like to see the validation work on this. Uh, but essentially, they conclude in their paper that they can calculate the absorbed dose to uh, for lutetium uh, PRRT, so lutetium uh, dota peptide therapy, um, with a single time point. If that single time point is taken four days after the activity administration, the, the dose, so they use this formula. So basically we calculate a dose rate from the image information, and then we multiply uh, the, the dose rate in each voxel by two times T1, T1 being the time to the single time point scan, divided by LUN2, and that gives us the dose. So they say that all 177 lutetium accumulating tissues showing mono exponential decay with effective half-lives of between 38 and 128 hours are well represented with an error of less than 10%. So this can treat or this can calculate a, a reasonably accurate dose to both organs at risk and to tumors. So we choose the Hanshard approximation here and then we calculate. The Hermes Medical Solutions voxel dosimetry software is applying a semi Monte Carlo method for dose simulation. So we have full photon Monte Carlo modeling to calculate the dose, and we use a local multiplying factor to calculate the electron dose contribution. So we come out with this dose map at the end. So what we're seeing here is a, a dose map. So the overlaid on the CT is dose map in units of dose. So we can see as I move the cursor around here, uh, we've got gray voxel values. And we can work directly on this now to get the dose to tumors and organs at risk. So let's do a few tumor doses to start with. This is our new affinity viewer, which makes this kind of analysis very quick and straightforward. So I will use this single click segmentation. This is going to apply a, a threshold of three gray. I'm just going to click on a couple of tumors. Let's go through and do a few, maybe this spinal tumor here as well. And we can see that they're starting to populate this table here. We can see gray uh, values here inside these regions. Uh, now, of course, maybe what you want to get is not easily, um, easily outlined with a threshold on, on the dose map itself. So I'm gonna try and do a nice kidney region here to show you how it would work. So let's move in on, on this kidney. So we can see a little bit of uptake, a little bit of dose in this, in this kidney, uh, but let's draw it based on the CT. So I'm going to use our paintbrush tool here to just outline the kidney as best as possible. I do one slice, I skip a few slices, I move to the next one. You see it will fill in the middle bit for you and you can see it's gradually making it up. So as I'm moving through the patient and as I'm drawing on more slices, the intervening slices are interpolated on the fly. So I'm going to take that bit out there. And we can always go back and smarten it up if it hasn't got the interpolation right. So maybe just here we could take a little bit off. Okay, let me just quickly finish this region off. Okay, something like that. So already we can see the doses in our results table here. You can see max, mean, gray, and so on. Uh, now, if we wanted to uh, label these, let's do some relabeling so that we can get a more clear picture here. So we are looking at the right kidney. And this one, and these, let's double click to triangulate and see what we've got. So we've got a, a liver lesion here. one is another liver lesion. And we're looking here at a spine region, so a spine lesion. So 
So we can look at this uh, information represented on a column chart as well. So we're looking at mean dose here. We can choose max. Um, and then, of course, a dose volume histogram presentation as well. If you wish to analyze this as external beam radiotherapy would, you can get the dose volume histogram for these four regions that I've drawn. Lastly, let's make a nice visualization. So we can take the regions that we've drawn, drag them onto this MIP with the volume rendered CT. It's going to hide the fusion there. Let's maximize this, zoom it up and show the region stats. So we can see here next to each of these regions that we've created what the stats are. So we can take a screenshot here um, or even a movie if you wish. We will hear from Lydia Ram. Lydia is a trainee clinical scientist working at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Lydia has been using the Hermes Medical Solutions dosimetry software in her project on lutetium 177 PRRT dosimetry. So clinical evaluation assessment of target and organ at risk doses is a requirement under legislation. And we can do this by um, performing dosimetry calculations on post-therapy nuclear medicine imaging for PRRT. So PRRT is administered as four cycles of 7,400 megabex. As you can see, tumor burden um, differs significantly across patients, which is why dose assessments are so vital. So at QEHB, we image our cycle one patients on day zero, one, four, and seven. On day zero, they have SPECT CT, and on one, four, and seven, they have SPECT only. We reconstruct these SPECT images using Voxel dosimetry by Hermes Medical Solutions. We then align the quantitative specs and generate a Voxel dose map. And this dose map, um, an example is given on the right hand side, that shows the absorbed dose per voxel in the image. And as you can see, the triangulation point in this image is showing a dose of full grey. We can then draw and grow volumes of interest and then obtain dose volume histograms for those volumes. So I first looked at kidney doses. Um, there's no official dose limit for the kidneys in PRT, so we use 23 grey from external beam radiotherapy. Uh, for 19 patients, the average left kidney dose was 3.5 grey, and for the right it was 3.9 grey. We multiplied these by four to get crude four cycle dose estimates of 14 grey for the left and 15.6 grey for the right. And 95% of patients were within the 23 grey limit. Uh, the one patient who was not within this limit had a tumour nestled um, right up against their right kidney, as shown in the figure in the top right. And that is most likely the reason for the high kidney dose, uh, but no um, degrading kidney function was um, reported for this patient. I also looked at tumour doses, so neuroendocrine tumour doses, and I selected these tumours um, across the same co of, cohort of patients based on their location, maximum axial diameter, SUV, and they had to be isolated enough that they did not bleed into other areas of heart uptake um, in the quantitative SPECT images. Uh, so I analysed 37 nets and the average dose was 14.4 grey. Uh, when comparing uh, absorbed dose with SUV max, also found with um, voxel dosimetry, there was very weak correlation showing that absorbed dose for tumours cannot be predicted um, using SUV max. You do need full dosimetry calculations for an accurate dose assessment. Uh, so in routine practice, we want to be producing dose reports for all cycle one patients, which will allow um, dose evaluation by the practitioner. And it will also allow the practitioner to request dosimetry at further cycles, as we are currently only routinely doing dosimetry for cycle one patients. Um, and this uh, report would be uploaded to PACS for review. Also with the report, a screenshot, screenshot of the uh, quantitative spec MIP will be included, as well as the corresponding dose volume histogram, as you can see in the images here. So from my project, I concluded that net dose is very significantly showing the need for individualised dosimetry, and that net dose can't be predicted using SUV max, meaning full dosimetry calculations are needed at every cycle. Uh, for the kidneys, um, the majority of patients were within the 23 gray limit, uh, showing that there is room for optimization. Although we can't alter the number of cycles at present, um, it does show that we are sufficiently evaluating kidney absorbed dose. 
So as I said, I've been using Voxel Dosimetry by Hermes Medical Solutions. It's one software package that covers each step required for dosimetry. So it allows for quantitative reconstructions, Voxel dose map generation, manual and automatic region and volume drawing. So uh, for the kidneys, I manually drew these on the CT and copied the volumes over, whereas for tumours, I grew them based on their SUV. And the software also then gives a detailed dose volume histogram data for organs at risk and neuroendocrine tumours. Um, so as well as it being very convenient, it's also fast and easy to use. Uh, thank you for listening and if you'd like to um, email me about my research then my email is just there. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, welcome to this Q&A session. Hopefully you have just come from the EANM platform where you've seen the Hermes uh, Medical Solutions Symposium on, on dosimetry. Uh, so just a quick recap of, of what we showed in that symposium. Uh, we started with Professor Giesel, uh, Frederick presenting on the impact of dosimetry in translational research and the added value uh, for probe developments. Then I did a, a demonstration of the Hermes software for, uh, for voxel dosimetry for single time point uh, dosimetry analysis. And then uh, Lydia Ram presented on the uh, lutetium 177PRRT uh, dosimetry in clinical practice. So we've got the three of us uh, on, on this chat, on this Q&A now, ready to answer your questions. So please, if you, if you have questions, uh, type them into the chat box. Hopefully you'll see um, a, a little chat box that you can type into um, and then we will um, answer your questions as best we can. Uh, so perhaps while we wait for, for a few questions to get started, um, I'm going to ask a question um, to, to Lydia to start with. Hi, Lydia. Welcome, welcome to the chat. Um, so it's a really impressive setup that you've got at uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. You've managed to get uh, three, I think, post time point uh, scans for lutetium therapy. And that's something that a lot of hospitals in the UK certainly have struggled to, to achieve clinically. Would you be able to like, talk us through some of the just the logistics and how you actually manage to implement that in your clinical routine? Yes, yeah, so um, our dosimetry service, it didn't come around overnight. So it's been um, in the process for a few years now. So prior to 2018, before um, PRRT, PRRT became funded in the NHS, um, we were doing the treatments and we had a nuclear medicine physician who was just interested in imaging at multiple time points. So this was before we actually even started doing dosimetry. So we would do um, whole body planar imaging at multiple time points for actually every cycle. Um, as we as the uh, treatment became funded, we started getting more and more patients. Um, so we needed some kind of compromise. So we moved to just doing multiple time point imaging at cycle one. So we went from four cycles just to one. So it's still a lot of scanning time, but it wasn't as much as doing at every single cycle. Um, and then when quantitative spec um, came into practice with uh, Hermes software, um, we then went from whole body to spec dosimetry. And because of the legislation, I know Frederick discussed this in his talk as well, um, we really should be evaluating doses in PRRT um, because tumour burden is different for all of our patients. So it's important that we do it. So we are just trying to comply with said legislation and we are holding on to these uh, multiple time point um, imaging slots, even though it is only for cycle one at the moment, that is still enough to show we are evaluating doses at that first cycle, which is obviously better than nothing. Certainly, yeah, thanks very much. That's really interesting. So you, what you said first was that it was actually a sort of clinical driver it was a, a doctor who was asking for this and maybe I can turn this over to to Fred now I think it's really important to have clinical input into this I think dosimetry has traditionally kind of been the preserver of physicists and physicists only and that's kind of pointless to, to keep it like that because the only useful thing it can do is provide sort of clinical information that can actually help treat a patient more effectively what's what's your your idea on this how, how do you think you can influence this from a, a doctor perspective um, I, I mean, I think we're also nuclear medicine is becoming now more and more also a kind of bigger, you know, uh, specialty in particular uh, theranostic in, in oncology. I, I do believe that we can learn also from other uh, specialties like, for example, radio oncology, where we have um, dose calculation and 
uh, two more uh, gray, so to say, dose uh, scaling is a very important and routine factor in, in that field. So I think becoming now more and more also in approval probes, like for example, PRRT, and now PSMA is actually just around the corner. I think that are topics that also we have to face, focus on, and, and should implement it. And that's and, and even a physician will not come with with this implementation. Regulatory um, authorities will will come around and also will have a certain request on that uh, on a patient-based uh, situation. I think so. That's great. Thank you so much. I completely agree. Okay, we have a few questions uh, from the audience. So the first question, I'm going to get this pronunciation so wrong, uh, is from Annie Bjarbak. Um, she asks, we have a new gallium-68 tracer that we will image for several time points for dosimetry reasons and biodistribution. What software from Hermes would you recommend in order to calculate absorbed doses and the effective dose? So I guess this is one for me, given it's a, a Hermes uh, software question. Uh, so it sort of depends what answer you want. So I would say that voxel dosimetry, which if you were in the uh, symposium just now, was the software that, that you saw there, that will give you the most accurate um, dose assessment because it does a dose map for the entire, um, the entire body. Um, so you won't, and it'll do it on a, a voxel basis as well. So you won't just get an average dose per organ, which is um, what the, the Olinda or the organ dosimetry software will give you. Um, you'll actually get um, yeah, sort of a voxel by voxel um, assessment of, of what dose was given. And that is the most accurate way of doing it. So um, picking up on, on Fred's point that we can look to radiation oncology um, and radiotherapy for how they report doses. What they report is with a dose volume histogram. And that gives you a proper assessment then of, uh, of the, the treatment of the, the volume that's actually treated to a certain dose level, which will, which will achieve um, an effect, uh, which is what we're really interested in, rather than just a kind of an average dose um, over the organ. So that, that being said, that's what voxel dosimetry does. If you are more interested, so traditionally, um, Olinda has been the calculation engine. I mean, it was the only calculation, calculation engine available for these kind of things in the past. Um, so a lot of the, um, the data that's been built up for other radio pharmaceuticals has been done with Olinda. Um, so that, that would be an organ level, um, that would be an organ level dose assessment. But if that's sufficient, maybe that's okay. It would be nicer though to have a proper voxel based one to get a true idea of, of treatment volumes. I hope that answered your question. Please feel free to, I don't know if anyone else has got any info on this, but please feel free to, to, to jump in. Or uh, Annie, if you'd like to uh, make a reply, then, then go ahead. Uh, okay, moving on to the, uh, the next question. Sorry, is someone trying to say something? I can. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Um, what is, so this is from uh, Yasek or, or Jacek Kapala. He asks, uh, what is the accuracy of the dose estimate for tumors and normal tissues? How does the data from one scan compare to more times and how does it depend on the ROI size? That's a really good question. Perhaps, Lydia, I know you've had lots of experience with drawing regions um, in, in Hermes and well, regions in general. Maybe you could um, give some, some idea for how the ROI size can affect the, the dose calculation. Yeah, so um, actually for, so we have been doing uh, lesion dosimetry as well as kidney dosimetry. Um, for the kidneys, we draw these manually on the CT and copy them to the spec data sets. Um, whereas for lesions, I um, well, we grow them from using an SUV. So we by default use an SUV of six. So um, the maximum SUV in a region, that's the seed point, and then it extends out until it reaches um, a boundary of six. Um, so obviously over time, uh, if the SUV of that lesion is changing, that is going to affect how big your lesion is. So it um, is not necessarily going to be standardized across every cycle but also um, as I said in my presentation we don't do dosimetry for cycles two to four we only do it for cycle one so unfortunately I haven't looked at dose over time only for cycle one I have looked at SUV max over time for lesions and how this changes and there is a change it isn't the same at every cycle and 
to be honest, we don't know whether that's because tumours are shrinking physically and whether they have become saturated with dotatate and they can't bind any further to the lutetium dotatate. So there's lots of variables and um, it would be lovely to do dosimetry at every cycle so we could see how doses are changing and, and correlate that to the size um, of the volume as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so for the first part of your question, what is the accuracy of the dose estimate for, for tumours and normal tissues? That's an absolutely excellent question. Um, our software does not as yet contain um, any kind of uncertainty calculation, although we are working on that uh, based on the ENM guidelines on this from, I think, 2018, they might have come out. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at how to, to model that uncertainty in, in lots of the input variables um, to these images and how that actually comes out in uncertainty in the dose calculation, because you know, from a, a physics perspective, it's it's nice to have that uncertainty there um, to really give you an idea of, of yeah what you're working with. Um, we do have, if you're interested in more uh, validation work that we've done on our dosimetry software, we do have um, several peer-reviewed publications which go into lots of detail on, um, on the algorithms uh, that we use, particularly for voxel dosimetry. So uh, you'll already know this if you just came from the ENM session, um, but the, the voxel dosimetry software uh, uses a, a semi-Monte Carlo method to calculate the dose. Uh, that means that so it's full Monte Carlo photon simulation. So we do just as, as you would in academia or in a university, do a full blown Monte Carlo simulation of the, um, the photon component of, of lutetium or the IAD131 or whatever you're treating with um, through the, the CT mu map um, of the patient to see where the dose is deposited. And then we just use a multiplying factor for the electrons. And, and that algorithm is actually the subject of a PhD thesis. Um, uh, and so we've done like a lot of validation on that, a lot of um, a lot of dose comparisons to make sure that what we're getting is accurate. Um, uh, there, I'd be very happy to send you uh, more more scientific references if you want to hear hear all the detail on on that one. Uh, okay, I think there's not too much other action going. Oh yes, excellent. All the questions come up. Okay, we have a question from Joseph uh, Grudzinski. Uh, he asks, if RPT is so safe with standard dosing, why do dosimetry in the first place? A controversial question. Uh, what can be done to enable treatment planning for dose escalation? So perhaps this is a question that, uh, that Fred might be able to give us some more information on. So uh, why, if it is safe, do we need dosimetry? Um, I mean, uh, I mean, my talk was just uh, the talk of translational research, where I think there is an obligation to have dosimetric data available. I think that's no doubt about that topic. So that means uh, if we have probe developments, if we want to know the absorbed dose uh, for the um, total body organ, we need to have an understanding, and we have to benchmark that to to other probes that has already reached the final uh, FDA approval. Uh, however, when we are coming into clinical care practice, and that's a, a, I would uh, even say it's a challenging and <laughs> provocative question, because um, is, is, there, uh, at, is there a need for dosimetric um, uh, procedures in clinical practice at all? I think I understand the question in this direction. And I do believe um, that's true that we learned that PRT is a safe. Um, we do also know that we have limited organs um, and therefore um, we need to have quantitative data on an individual basis uh, of patient care level uh, available so that we did everything in the right direction. And if we are only be a specialty of doing a dose uh, calculation on a rule of thumb, I think that's not something that is uh, in the future the right way to go. It does not always mean that uh, impact this patient care uh, in many, many cases, maybe on limited perspective, but it's a question of um, how we will develop our medical field of nuclear medicine in regard to theranostics. And we have someday to start with the topic of having an obligation 
of dosimetric uh, procedures in clinical care practice. And that's something that if it's not done by us and if it's not leaded by us, it will come from governmental authority at one time point. And we see it already if you look to certain discussions on the United Nation on IAEA level and also US and uh, European Union level. So I think it's not always a question of does it impact now in certain rare disease patients? It's a question how we want to develop in the future. And there we cannot neglect the patient preparation and doing a dose escalation. And that's something that is not something I do it because I would like to and be interested. It's an obligation of also documentation of patient care. That's that's my understanding of dosimetry. And it seems to be at the moment very time consuming and very, I mean, human labor um, uh, associated. But as I also indicate in my talk, and uh, I, I think uh, Lydia and uh, Elena can, can support that, we are now in the area of switching the gear from um, supercomputing, where this can rather be also be done by an outsourcing um, service provider as a cloud services. But we have then evident of data on each patient available. And that's something where our treatment and we can reassure that we did everything right from the dose and its distribution on an individual patient care level. I think that's that's the main message on, on, on that statement. So it's not the question of should we do it? We have to do it. Yeah, completely agree with everything that you said in that answer. Thank you. And just to add, in the comparison with, with radiation oncology, with external beam radiotherapy, in there, the, the oncologist says, I want to treat this tumor to this dose level because uh, I know from, from trial data that this will treat it. We have nothing like this in nuclear medicine. We are giving these very damaging and, and quite expensive therapies, and we have no real evidence that they're going to work, um, which is pretty scary in a way. So that's really the, the need uh, for, for dosimetry. Uh, and I, I would let just jump in in that I, I would Please. a little bit free phrase that uh, <laughs> I would not say scary or something. I think the dose is well um, also defined in the NETA trial and the phase three trial for PRT. And, and the same thing uh, is done with the PSMA uh, treatment approaches. There are certain at least guidelines of at least having a line of what kind of rule of thumb of dose we have. But we also need to have an extracted number that we do know what of kind of um, total tumor dose we are applying to each individual patient so that we also make evidence that the treatment that we are doing will be affected on patient care level. And I think that's, that's a something. I think nuclear medicine will not damage at the moment. I think we're doing fine. And I mean, we are doing PRT over 10 years also with, with a corridor of prior to phase three approval. And it worked very, very nice in the most late stage patient. But also, and that's what I'm meaning with nuclear medicine will more and more going from late stage to early stage treatment um, uh, purposes and drug developments. And if we are leaving the corridor of late stage patient to rather early treatment, and you, if you look to PCMA trials, they are starting also in a very early line already this treatment, then I think there is a need of this kind of application. Absolutely, thank you. And just to answer the, the second part of that question, what can be done to enable true treatment planning for dose escalation? I think so, Lydia, you touched on your, um, uh, your protocol at, at Birmingham, which is to do uh, the full dosimetry measurements on the first cycle of LU TCM dotatate and then make a scaling for the rest, or perhaps in the future to make a scaling based on that in the rest. Is that, is that what you're, you're doing? Yeah, so in the UK and in the NHS, patients are only funded for four cycles. We can't keep treating like you can in other countries. But by establishing our dosimetry procedures now, in the future, whether that's five years down the line, 10 years down the line, when we are in a position to personalise treatments and treat um, with more cycles, we can use that dosimetry data from cycle one to determine um, what estimate doses are going to be to the kidneys and tumours and come up with some kind of um, four cycle, five cycle dose estimate 
um, for these volumes. So yeah, it's definitely something for the future, but it's important that we establish it now. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, okay, the next question. So we, we, I think we're heading towards the end of this session, but I think we can just squeeze a few more questions in. One of my colleagues can come in and stop me if that's not okay, but I'm just gonna keep plowing on um, while we can. So I've got a question here from, uh, from Naresh Kumar. Uh, he asks, how can we calculate residence time without any dosimetry toolkit software for organ and tumor dosimetry? Well, that would be with a, a spreadsheet. So what you would need to do is get uh, multiple time points of, um, uh, of imaging after your patients had their therapy. And then, so maybe you've got a, a day one, a day four, a day seven for, for lutetium PRRT, it would be different time points uh, with, with a different pharmaceutical. Um, and then you'd calculate the activity in the liver, for example, or in your tumor. Uh, on, on the first time point, the second time point, third time point, then you would decide a function that you want to fit to that, or you can just do a, a trapezium rule um, integration if you want to get the area under the curve. And from that, so the residence time is directly related to the area under the curve of that graph. Um, so that's a real big faff. If you don't have nice dosimetry software to, to help you, which is where Hermes comes in. So hopefully that's answered your question. And now we have a question from Babak Savoy. Hi, Babak. He says, um, what we do is absolutely effective. The question is how to make it more effective from good to excellent. OK, um, I think we have probably answered that in uh, with the discussion in the last question. Just the idea that, you know, currently, well, certainly with TCM PRRT, uh, we, we work to the, um, the kidney um, limiting dose, whereas we don't really, I don't think, try to say, you know, to, to cure this tumor, to actually make it a curative treatment rather than just a palliative uh, treatment. We could actually try to treat to a 60 gray threshold, for example, if that would be the effective one. I don't know if that data is even out there about what we need to treat to in nuclear medicine to, to achieve um, a tumicidal dose. Um, but for me, that's where I would like to see the field going. I don't know if anybody has anything to add to that, but um, yeah. Uh, oh, we have another one from Babak. I think this is more a comment than a question. So we have, we need a platform for clinical improvement of practice. It is an obligation. Uh, hang on. It is an obligation. Uh, it is paradigm of the learning healthcare system. Okay, sounds very sensible. Uh, another question from Annie. Um, we examined the CERT workflow in Hermes organ dosimetry, but we found that only the BSA method is used. Uh, will there be possible, will it be possible to use the partition model soon? Uh, yes, uh, we are working on software that um, will, not, will include the partition model, but also a proper voxel based model, because the partition model also does a, a regional um, average uh, dose, but we think it would be better to do that on a, a voxel basis. Uh, so yes, certainly. Uh, more questions from, from Joseph. Is the challenge for acquiring multi-time points a patient compliance issue, physician messaging issue, cost, or something else? Um, maybe Lydia, you could you could talk on that one. Yeah, so with multiple time point imaging, so we're doing on day zero, so four hours after administration, and then on days one, four, and seven. That's a lot of time, and especially if patients are coming from far-flung areas, um, they may be coming to and from on public transport, so then you need to think about the things from a radiation protection uh, perspective for the people that they're around. Um, so it is a commitment. Um, we do tell our patients in advance that we would like them to have four scans, um, and they do really need to comply with this. We do have options to treat as an inpatient, so at least on day zero and day one, the patient will be um, in the vicinity for their scan, so they don't need to travel up again on day one for a scan. But no, it's definitely um, down to patient compliance, um, scanning slots. Because we treat um, in cycles eight to 12 weeks apart, we can plan in advance um, if further dosimetry is requested for cycles two, three, or four. Um, so it's something that we can accommodate and because it is just routine practice now, everyone 
is prepared for that and we all know that um, it's coming and that we have a new cycle one patient and they're going to be scanned four times in a week. So yeah, but definitely patient compliance is important and we try to um, uh, pass that on to them and make them understand uh, why it is so important to have these dosimetry scans. Thank you. I think that's a really important point is to be able to communicate that to the patient. Uh, because the thing is that that's already the expectation for radiation oncology so again making the comparison with radiation oncology for external beam radiotherapy people would attend you know maybe 20 times for, for fractionated um, external beam radiotherapy and if, if we can prove that what we're going to do is the same if we're going to be truly treating the cancer as external beam would be um, then I think we can we can justify this and hopefully the patient will appreciate the need for them to, to come so many times um, to, to really make this treatment the most effective that it can be. Yeah. I think that's something we found, um, my colleagues have found difficult in the past when they were scanning um, at multiple time points for cycles two, three and four, is that the, the novelty wears off a bit, I think, especially when the patients um, know that these scans aren't affecting the treatment. They've had the treatment, it's just that these are extra scans for us. So at least doing it at cycle one, that is something. And like I said before, it is better than nothing. So. Wrong extra scans for us that's an interesting way of saying it yeah it's <laughs> i can understand that coming from a patient analyze, yeah <laughs> yeah just physics want this don't we yeah <laughs> uh okay looking okay. for some more questions uh so we have uh another one from from naresh uh, perhaps, Naresh, the best thing to do would be to arrange a demonstration with us. Then you can ask. You've got some quite detailed technical questions here. I uh, would be happy to talk to you offline about them. But just this last one that you asked, how accurate uh, is the manual calculation of residence time in comparison with any dosimetry software for organ and tumor dosimetry? I mean, so all we do in the software is we apply that, that method. So the, the, the basic concept, what we're trying to do is to, to see how the activity changes over time in the region of interest, whether that's an organ or whether it's a tumour. And so all, all you have available is whatever imaging time points um, were, were acquired. And then it's just a way of trying to work out um, how to fit between them and how to also extend that out to um, to, to infinity, how to, to finish off the, um, the, the activity change in, in the patient. Uh, so really, we just have the same things um, available, just fitting tools. Um, to, to be able to, to model that. Uh, the accuracy, to be honest, is limited by how many imaging time points you can, you can acquire. That's probably the most important uh, factor in the accuracy of that calculation. Um, I hope that made sense. And yeah, please feel free to, to arrange a demonstration with us um, to ask me more difficult questions <laughs> that are very technical, if, if you'd like. Uh, OK, we have a question from Amit Nortio. And uh, they ask, is it feasible to implement voxel-based dosimetry in routine clinical practice, which is considered as a gold standard method? Also, multi-time specs is cumbersome procedure, uh, which required for voxel level dose estimation. So just to take the last part of your question there. So I don't know if you were able to see the EANM um, presentation that we just gave, but the, the voxel dosimetry software from Hermes Medical Solutions is now able to do single time point dosimetry, uh, which will give you um, an, an, a dose calculation within 10% of, of the true value, um, which is really great. And that's something that can be much less cumbersome for your, for your patients. And I guess the answer to your, your first part, is it feasible to implement voxel-based dosimetry in routine clinical practice is we would say, yes, I believe so. And that's what Lydia has been, been talking about. And these Hermes uh, products that we've been talking about are all CE marked FDA approved products. So that it's completely feasible for you to use clinically. And for which is considered a gold standard method, uh, that's, it's difficult to say in, in dosimetry. So it's because of dosimetry, it's very, very difficult to make any um, direct measurement of, of dose deposited in a patient. Normally the, the gold standard in, a, in an academic setting would be um, just a full Monte Carlo simulation. So I guess I would say the closest that we can get to that is that the Hermes voxel dosimetry software where we use that semi Monte Carlo method with for, for the photon uh, part of the simulation. Um, but truly, the true gold standard is probably um, a full Monte Carlo simulation, which would be something that, that would be done in academia, you know, in universities, um, 
only, to, to be honest. Um, yeah. I would uh, just oh. indicate too that the uh, fast Monte Carlo method was validated against that exact Penelope Monte Carlo that you're saying would be our gold standard, just just as an addition. Absolutely. Thanks, Andy. That was um, Andy Prudo, my colleague from, from the US, also a dissimetry expert for Hermes Medical Solutions. All right. I think there, we've there probably... Was one, actually, oh. there was one more question, I think, Helen. I know you Thanks, Steve. Uh, from uh, Ravi Kumar at 1342 in the list. That residence time and cumulative. Uh, <coughs> ah, that says, OK, so he says, is residence time and I guess that, so we're reading cumulative activity uh, the same. Um, so yes, it is. So you meet the cumulative activity and then you divide by the injected activity to get an answer in uh, megabecks. Well, so you, inj you integrate and you get megabecks times hours, and then you divide by the injected megabecks and you just get hours there, which is your effective residence time. Um, or like sort of more, more easier to understand as cumulated activity divided by injected activity. Um, okay, great. Um, we have one more question from Farzana Adipur. Uh, they ask, can we use the single time point method for overlapping organs too? Um, tricky one. So uh, in our software, you are able to make, so basically the, the Homies Medical Solutions voxel asymmetry program gives you a dose map at the end. So you get something that looks kind of like um, a spec, but it's a proper dose map simulation that's been done and the voxel units are gray. And then you just draw on that what you want to analyze. So if you had a little bit of tumor overlapping on, on the kidney, you could actually assign voxels from, um, from that overlap region to, to both regions if you wanted to, or you could just do one or the other. I guess that kind of depends on your own choice as to what you think is, is the best thing to use uh, physically. Uh, I mean, so you're, you're looking at a spec here, basically. So um, yes, there, so if you have a spec, you don't get the overlapping organs problem. Sorry, that was what I, I think was. that's the answer. I think the yeah. overlapping <laughs> organs is a plain or a problem that we can Correct. avoid by having spec in general. Thank you, Marcus. Absolutely. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. Right. I think we don't have any more questions, Steve. I think that's correct. No more. Nothing more I, going I can't on. Can't say any more. Great. No, All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Fred and Lydia, for joining me. Thank you, audience, for participating and asking questions. Thank you for watching this program that we hope you have found interesting and inspiring. We will be happy to discuss with you how to bring these tools to your clinical practice. Once again, thank you for joining us and hope to hear from you soon.